Hello and welcome to the East-West Quantum Leap Symphonic Orchestra orchestration for metal tutorial episode 2 where we're going to be taking a look at um, expression and realistic MIDI programming. Now these are both things that are vital to get a realistic sound. First of all, being able to use different expressions and articulations in the music and secondly, uh, with the way that you program the MIDI, you can also make things sound a lot more realistic than they do when you just do basic programming. Part one, I'm going to show you how you can use the expression articulations and key switches in Quantum Leap, which is universal for every DAW. I will also be looking at Cubase expression maps in particular because they're very useful if you've got Cubase. I think version 4 or 5 and above uh, will support expression maps. And then we're going to have a look at some tricks that I use on the MIDI side of things with the programming to add another layer of realism to that. Firstly, with Quantum Leap, what you want to do with an instrument, I'm going to pick something like a solo cello that I've already loaded here, but to show you what I loaded... You get different expression options. You can choose long or short bows, different effects, modulation wheel. I always just load this key SW, which stands for key switch, and I load the master one, which what that means is it's loading every single articulation so that I have them all at my fingertips when I need them. Now I've already loaded them, and on the keyboard there are some highlighted blue keys at the bottom and a couple at the top here. They are called the key switches, and when I push one of them, that decides what type of expression my cello has. And the list of expressions for this cello are in this articulations panel here. And we can see at the top C0, sustained vibrato, smooth. So when C0 is depressed here, that is the type of articulation or expression the note will have. C sharp is a legato, D is a legato. We'll be coming on to legato shortly. That's a useful tool to, uh, to use. A handy hint up here, the different expressions aren't always the same volume. Something like a Q legato is usually going to be louder than the expressive vibrato down here. And you'll see there are volume controls next to them. And I have raised that expressive vibrato by 1.3. Some I've reduced down a bit. You will find that you need to do that to maintain the volume because it starts to sound a bit jumpy if you change expressions, but the volume changes. So if you're finding that happens, don't forget you've got this option here to, to help you, especially if you hit your 127 on the volume and you've got nowhere else to go. And there are two ways of controlling these expressions and articulations and how you move between them. One of them is using key switches. What will happen is we have, as you can see here, C0 to almost G there, and then up here about C5, I think it is. And we can control this in our MIDI programming, which I will show you if I close this here and we have a look. I've got a cello MIDI line here, very simple scale. We'll just play that normally for you now. Okay, that's all as one expression. What I can do, this is playing at C2. If I scroll down to where C0 is, which you will remember is the expression, what I would do is start off with the basic expression, and then I'll choose a random one up here, which I will start halfway through the scale, and we'll hopefully hear that because that will now get triggered at C, D, E, F, G, 0, the expression will change as we move through. Now, one thing to be careful of is lining up here with these key switches. You'll see I've started my first one early because I want to make sure that that is what my expression starts out as. And when it changes, I've done it exactly in line. Now, that will work most of the time, but if you're running, say, 10, 12 different instruments, which isn't unusual for an orchestra, Sometimes the latency causes that to be delayed and the first note that you want to be changed won't actually make it in time. So what I actually do is take off my quantizing and I always move it back before. Now it doesn't matter that it overlaps this previous note. The note, once it starts, cannot change its expression. So when this starts, it will still be the C0 expression. And by the time the next note starts, it's already been activated with the different expression. So that's well within time. And even if there is some latency issue and it bounces down, it won't matter. And in fact, what I'm going to do is change this second expression and, and move it up to one that's a, a very different so that we definitely hear the expression change. There we go. 
put that there. This should be a pizzicato type effect. So let's play this and see what happens. Cool, as you can see that works pretty well. One final thing, often when you start MIDI programming, like I've done here, when you're lining up your, your files and the space as to where you're going to do your programming, you normally start on the first bar, obviously. Now, if you have an expression starting previous to that, you will need to expand your MIDI MIDI uh, area there. It won't read it unless it's expanded. And in Cubase, you'll see this part borders here. As you'll see, I've started that a whole bar early just to make sure I catch any expression changes that I want to make. While I'm in this window, another thing that's worth pointing out is the velocity. For the purposes of the tutorial, I've started at 127. I would recommend going at about 110, something like that, because then you have the extra volume there for accents and things like that. You can set your standard velocity here. If I've changed that to 110 here, then everything that I write will be at 110 so that you don't have to change every single thing as you go through. So that's another useful shortcut there. Now that's the universal method for controlling the key switches, but with Cubase we have the added option of expression maps, which I prefer to use. As an example of how these work, if I select my cello here, you'll see down the left hand side I have an option for an expression map, and it says there's no expression map set. If I click on there and go into the setup, I've loaded a different one, a contrabass one, just to give you an example here. Over here on the sound slots we have everything that's been set up with the different types of expressions and you see there's a plus and a minus. We can add different ones here and you have all sorts of options for what you're going to uh, to do there. I'm going to not show you this because I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but uh, firstly over on the right with articulations you then have an option for choosing the behavior of the articulation. Again, I'm going to come onto this in a second. The reason you don't really need to know how to set these up is that someone has very kindly already done this for us. It's uh, a website called Riveted Studios. I will put a link in the description. Um, this guy has spent a long time creating the expression maps for every single instrument in the Symphonic Orchestra library. So absolutely wonderful. Hats off to the guy. I mean, that's a lot of work. I certainly wouldn't have wanted to do it. And it's free as well. Obviously, he doesn't charge for it. So that's really, really good of him to have done that. Uh, I'll come back to these articulations because there is something important to, to set there. But what I would do is load the one I've got for the cello. So in the load option down here, you'll see I've got them all from this guy. Find the cello that I'm using, open that and close it. That's there, click on the solo cello. Now when I open my MIDI area, down in the modulation area where it's currently showing velocity, you'll see there's an option to look at articulations and dynamics. And if I click that now, you'll see all those expressions are now sitting there. I'm going to delete the ones I'd created before because I now have the option. I can see what they are. I don't have to worry about C0, G sharp, 1, whatever they might be. I don't have to remember them. I might decide, okay, I want expressive upwards bow to start for the first lot. You'll see how I'm starting it early again. And I may want one of those pixicato ones again to start for the second half. And... That does exactly the same thing as the key switches. We'll just listen to that again so you can have a have a listen. Okay, that works really well. You can add any in all, all over the place per note exactly as you would with the key switches. It's just a lot easier because having their names here allows you to see exactly what you're doing. I'm just going to un undo them. Now, one thing I did need to explain again in this expression map now that you've seen that in action. Under articulations, there's a type called direction or attribute. What that means is that going back into here, a direction, which all of mine are set to, means that if I delete these two articulations, you'll, or delete that one, you'll see the first one I entered, because it was set to direction, it's going to continue until another expression comes along to change it and then it automatically cuts off. And you'll see that one now continues until something comes along to change it. That, I find, is the most convenient way of writing. If you choose attribute, which is the other option, 
what will happen is you'll click here and it will only affect the note that it's assigned to, the nearest note. You'll see there's green lines here. These green lines appear wherever a note is written. And wherever you put an expression next to those notes, if they were set to attributes, they would stop as soon as the note stops. I find that pretty useless myself because if I want all of these to be expressive up, that would take ages to just draw them for each one. So I find it to be a real time saver if we go back into the map setup. When you get all of these maps from this, this guy, don't know his name, unfortunately, I would change them all to direction. He uses some as attributes and uh, I've changed all mine to direction for all the ones that I use. So that's a really useful thing to know. And if you find your expressions aren't working as you would expect, this is usually the reason why. By the way, I'd just like to say at this point, uh, if this video is a bit more disjointed than my previous ones, then uh, sorry about that, but I don't script these. I just uh, get an idea about what I'm going to talk about and get on with it, really. So there's a lot I wanted to cover here, but I didn't want the video to go on for too long. As usual, there are links down the left-hand side for you to skip through if you need to. Um, and uh, really, it was just a necessary part of this video to make sure I cut out any of the unnecessary material. Okay, on with the MIDI programming. It's very important that you make full use of those expressions that I just showed you to help with the expressiveness of what you're programming because obviously in real life, someone doesn't just play the notes with the same expression throughout a whole song. So it is vital that you use them and use them regularly, even as far as changing each note sometimes. Another thing I want to cover with this is just some tricks that I use with my MIDI programming to help with the realism. Firstly, I've got an example here of some brass. Uh, this is French horn. If we have a quick listen to what this sounds like, this is just a simple scale like the cello was. Okay, and I've programmed a kick drum, and we're going to hear what this sounds like with the kick drum and the cello, to, uh, the French horn together. Now you probably noticed there that the French horn all of a sudden sounds out of time, even though it looks like it's perfectly quantized here. What happens is with a lot of instruments in an orchestra, the attack doesn't reach its highest volume until a few milliseconds after you start the note. So in cases like this, the French horn, when I've got it at this volume with whatever expression it's set to, which is just the, the default one, I believe, even though it's quantized, it's not sounding to the ear like it's quantized. So when you're programming these kinds of things, you can't always trust what you're seeing. And often, this will depend on the instrument, but often you will have to make an adjustment of this sort of level to make it sound like it's in time. And if we give this another listen now, I think we'll find this probably sounds a lot better. That is the same for strings as well, certainly, especially the more expressive ones where you get these swelling strings. You will often need to pull them back slightly before the start of the beat to make everything fit together. And uh, if you find that anything is sounding out of time, this will be the reason why. So you would just need to listen to each instrument in turn. Listening to them with the metronome, the click, is uh, very handy to then get an idea as to what needs to be done to make them sound in time properly. And another thing I want to cover is managing the expressions depending on what else is playing. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. I uh, have here another cello. I've set this to expressive vibrato. And if we have a quick listen to what it sounds like. That sounds really, really nice. And on its own, it's brilliant and it would sound lovely with the rest of the orchestra. But if you've got that with heavy guitars, the way it swells in, I promise you, you'd really lose the beginning quite a lot and it'd lose its impact and it would start to sound like the timing was a bit different. And there's lots of factors that come together to mean that that kind of really nice swell and expressive note doesn't work so well when you've got something like heavy guitars or blast beats going on or anything like that. So what you need to do is try and replicate that without having that extreme surge in volume. And the way we do that, we'll get rid of that expressive vibrato. Firstly, I pick something like the Q legato is a good one for metal, because if we listen to what this sounds like now, volume is steady as well as the expression. Mm. 
See, the uh, attack is very good as well there, so it may need to be shifted back like the brass was a little bit, but that swell would need to be shifted back a lot before it uh, sounded like it was in time. So that's one benefit for it. The Q Legato is good for coming in with a nice strong attack. One problem with it, though, is that it doesn't merge from one note to the next particularly smoothly. It's a bit of a choppy sound. If you give it another listen and listen out for the way it moves between notes. <laughs> If you listen carefully, you can hear it's a, not so much a jump, but it doesn't sound particularly natural. There's a couple of things we can do to reduce that quite a lot. Firstly, I like to increase the tail end of each note so that it overlaps the following note. East West and many programs that do this kind of thing have got intelligent software that knows when this is occurring and it adds legato in. Legato is the, the way the note moves from one to the next. It's sort of a slide, almost a smooth transition. If you had a da 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 da, that is very that's non legato. It's very hard attack, and each note is deliberately separate. But if we went da, excuse my singing there, but you could hear that was a lot smoother, and that would be legato where it's much smoother. And by overlapping the notes. The Quantum Leap software knows this is what you want to achieve and it adds a bit more of that in for you. At this stage it's quite subtle, but we're going to increase the effect of it. On the left here you see where articulations were that we picked earlier. In this list, CC7, if you look in the Quantum Leap manual, that is the uh, system exclusive code for the volume. With nothing drawn here, it automatically pumps everything out at full volume. You'll remember earlier on I said to keep your velocity at around 110 that I've done he up here to mean that you can increase things to 127 for accents. If I draw in one volume point here, you'll see I've now got a, a graph. This can be edited, but this graph is up at 127. And that means that the 127 here will mean this pumps out at 110, as it should do. If I lower it, this is now an 85. This will not pump out at 110, it will pump out at the equivalent lower down to, to 85 or similar. What I want to do here is create my own swell, like the expressive articulation did, but it's not going to be quite so intense so that it doesn't mess up the attack of the sound so much. So I just draw in a bit bring it back down for the start of the next note. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. We don't want it to be exactly the same. And then I'm going to drop that right off for the last note. We don't want them to be exactly the same. We don't want them to be too neat because this is how it ends up sounding a lot more human, a lot more realistic. Let's try and smooth that off a bit and we'll hear what this sounds like. This should sound a lot nicer. <laughs> I'm actually going to redraw this to uh, see if I can get that sounding a bit better. So maybe bring that down here to a bit higher, a bit more. I'll leave that end bit as, as it was. Let's try that. Okay, that adds a bit more expression to it, but it's not quite so much a swell as the expressive vibrato. So when I finish this video, I'm going to put some screenshots up of some more of the MIDI programming that I've done, and you'll see that I've drawn volume uh, swells and reductions like this all the way through songs, and it really is necessary to keep that realism up. And also this legato trick of increasing the tail a bit works extremely well when you feel that the notes aren't sticking together properly with the particular type of expression you've chosen. Okay, and one final thing I wanted to cover was the performance scripts. So these are very useful because they've added an extra layer of subtlety to the sound. I'm going to get rid of that Q legato. This is if you want a bit more expression again. Again with the cello, something like the sustained vibrato smooth, it's a fairly stable sound but a bit more expressive than the Q legato. Let's have a listen. Pretty nice sounding there. And because it's a sustain and a vibrato, the legato works a bit better with that. There is a legato script. Now, I'm going to bring up their manual quickly. 
the way the scripts work for legato and portamento portamento is where there's an a, a audible slide between notes but it's extremely subtle on this program you have the option to turn legato and portamento on and off somewhere here as i wanted to show you as you can see it says here the effects of engaging them are very subtle the goal is to make a sound smooth to connect playing and not anything so pronounced that it would draw attention to the effect we can turn legato on and off and portamento on and off in the same way that we do the the volume changes the code for legato is 68 i've got this set up here and the code for portamento is 5 or also 65 i think you can change the amount of the portamento with 5 and you turn it on or off with 65 but i'll show you what i mean with the legato i'm going to pick 68 and i'm going to tell it to turn the legato on halfway through uh, the first note now this is interesting. When I move my mouse up and down here, over on the left here, you can, you'll be able to see the volume, so I know what value I'm choosing. Anything above 64 will turn it on, and anything below will turn it back off. So I could turn it back off there. That's 42, so that's below. What I will do is bring up the play engine, so you can see here is our legato button. We will... Bring this to here, bring up the MIDI again, where are we, there we are, so we can hopefully see these both in action. Okay, we're going to see the legato turn on at this point and turn back off down here, you'll see this button go on and off, the sound will be subtle difference but hopefully you will hear it, here we go. And back off again there you see. That's very handy, again, very subtle, but it does help. It's all these things that when you add them together, help you make a really nice, realistic sounding orchestra. That's really all I want to cover here. Uh, I'm going to be doing a third video, uh, which is going to talk more about mixing these sounds with metal, what inserts you need to put on them to help it all fit together nicely, and what you would want to do in the final mastering stage as well. So hopefully that's been of some help for you. Thanks to everyone who watched the first video. I got a lot of really nice comments about that. I'm really chuffed that everyone liked that so much so thank you very much i hope you enjoyed this one too and the third one won't be too far away hopefully cheers